Um, I am curator here at the Stanley Museum of Art. We just had a name change, so we're working on that. Um, I'm also the director of the Intermedia Research Initiative, uh, which was uh, begun uh, through the largesse of uh, Hans Brader, who's up here. Um, Hans and Barbara Brader. Um, and the idea was really to kind of create a space where cross-disciplinary ideas could be fostered um, and also find ways to kind of reach out into the broader community. And so it's really an amazing opportunity that we have today um, to have uh, PS1 and also Center for Afrofuturist Studies um, host this wonderful um, kind of discussion about the work of Adam Pendleton. As you may or may not know, Adam Pendleton uh, is the author of Black Dada, What Can Black Dada Do For Me? Black Dada, Black Dada, a reader. Um, and Adam Pendleton is an artist whose work kind of encompasses every possible approach, um, but he's very conceptual in his orientation. Um, and so what he kind of created here, it was published in 2011, is a reader that, as you can kind of, well, I'll pass it around, is actually insistently photocopied. So you feel the kind of photocopied quality of it. Um, and so it's a kind of compilation or a kind of, um, it's a reader uh, with all sorts of different kinds of sources. And so we have three uh, members of our community who will be talking about uh, passive or specific texts um, in relation to this whole kind of idea of black data, um, but also specifically about the text themselves. Um, this, all of this kind of program, the, the uh, Adam Pendleton's uh, basically our last major data related program um, that we're doing this year. It relates to the exhibition that's on right now that was co-curated uh, by Jen Buckley, Stephen Voice, and also uh, Tim Scheip. Um, and we also had a big data symposium in February. And so we're really pleased that we're kind of closing things or kind of bring everything together with this discussion, but also to welcome um, uh, Adam Pendleton when he comes to speak on Thursday. So that's this week uh, on Thursday, 7.30, uh, Art Building West. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Camille Strong um, and John Engelbrecht uh, of the, well, just tell me, yeah. of uh, <laughs> the PS1. And she represents both PS1 and Center for Afro Futures. Yeah. So uh, I'm Camille Strong, I'm the program director at Public Space One, which is the home of the Center for Afro Futures Studies. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of us and um, Anais Dupont, who is um, the founder of that program, um, is currently in New York. Um, and um, we're really, really excited to have this program today. Thank you so much for coming out and being inside on a really beautiful day. Um, uh, I don't want to say too much, uh, but I do want to mention that we do have a, um, one, the Center for Afrofuturist Studies has uh, hosted 11 artists in residence over the past two and a half years, um, and uh, 2018 has started as a year of reflection and figuring out what our future programs are going to be, and so this is the first um, real program that we've done in 2018, so that's exciting. And then we also have something coming up next week, which is um, we're going to be unveiling a large-scale banner on the uh, north side of our building, the Wesley Center building, um, that was created by Kat Reynolds, who is an artist in residence. Um, here through the CAS uh, last year. Um, so that's part of Dazzle Crawl, which is collaboration with Hancher and other people. Um, but that's happening on Friday night. So that's our second CAS uh, program that's happening in a one week period, basically. Um, so um, I am just going to introduce the three readers that we have today. And thank you so much to Tim, especially um, for uh, putting this together rather at the last minute and being game to do a sort of experimental format. Um, for this event. Um, and the only other thing, I wanted to do a, re a micro reading as part of my introduction from the reader also, which is just to read one sentence that um, quotes Adam Pendleton from one of the introduction, or one of the critical essays in the reader, um, which felt um, like it was speaking to some of the work that we're trying to do through the Center for Afrofuturist Studies, um, in which she's quoted as saying, Black Data is a way to talk about the future while talking about the past. It is our present moment. Um, and I will let uh, the readers uh, do the rest of the reading from the book, but um, I will introduce them 
all right now, um, and then just let them go through. Um, and they're each going to read, as Joyce mentioned, a selection from the book, and then um, reflect on it a little bit, and then we'll open it up. We hope it'll be a conversational um, second part to the event. Um, so, um, I'm also sitting. <laughs> um, so, um, Mariam Thager is um, an associate professor at the Moon Center, um, is an associate professor of English and Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies here at the university, and the director of graduate studies for GWIS. Um, her first book was Images of Black Modernism, Verbal and Visual Strategies of the Harlem Renaissance, and she is currently working on her second book, which is a social and literary history of African American women and the American Railroad. Um, a second reader, um, Azalea Adegume, um, who is a queer cis femme artist scholar of perceivable African descent and the offspring of immigrants. Um, she asked me to cut her bio, but I like it. I think it's really good, so I'm going to read it. Um, um, so if you say any of this stuff later, you can just know that it. Um, her creative, critical, and social practices are undergirded by interests in aesthetics, the politics of pleasure, the lived experiences and media productions of people embodying multiple marginalized identities, the hyper-invisibility of blackness and varying types of death. Her written work has been featured in Bustle, Gawker, the Iowa Review blog, Critical Studies and Media Communication, Fightland and Racialicious, among others. Um, she is the author of Bird Bolt's Idolatry, a poetry chapbook, and she's currently at work on a book-length essay and an artist book centering black women's art and activism in the 19th and 20th century United States. And then finally, um, Raj Chakrapani is a recent graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and he has lived in Romania, Liberia, and Myanmar, Myanmar as a Peace Corps volunteer and also a teacher for the U.S. Department of State. Presently, he teaches creative writing for new media here at the university. His poems can be found in Speculative City, Lana Turner, the Des Moines Register, um, Sequestrum, and elsewhere. He also makes short films, which are available on YouTube. Thank you. Entered in this text um, by Joan Halak. It's uh, she describes it as three essays on two shaky grounds. Um, I'm going to be reading from excerpts of the very first one. In our silence, out of docile bodies and silent minds, out of multiple silences, more and more audible, we've constructed theories and accounts of a historical endurance and power we call women's silence. This is only one of many silences to which an increasingly heterogeneous and problematic we is attending after modernism's figure ground shaking now. Isn't it, come to think of it, curious that the 20th century project of conceptual reorientation came so often to silence? There are Wittgenstein's aphoristic and Beckett's elliptical silences, Gertrude Stein's silences of depunctuation and repetition, Kristeva's semiotic silences, John Cage's resounding silences filled with ambient noise, Anne-Marie Albiak's, Rosemary Waldrop's, Hannah Wiener's, Susan Howe's, Lynn Hegenian's, Nicole Brossard's, Tina Darrow's, Charles Bernstein's, Diane Ward's, Leslie Scalapino's, Tom Raworth's, Bruce Andrews's, Rod Smith's, Carla Harriman's, Peter Inman's, Teresa Hakim Cha's. Poetical silences of counter-syntactic and divested forms as well as testimonies and sacrifices of silence we associate with names like Virginia Woolf, Tilly Olson, Sylvia Plath, Audre Lorde, Adrian Rich. There are a lot of parentheticals, and so maybe when there are parentheticals, we'll just do it like that. The cultural silences that befall radical difference will prolong the obscurity of some of the names I've listed. I guess I close parentheses. What we've learned from this coincidence of silences, as venerable and portentous as a siege of herons or a murder of crows, is that silence itself is nothing more or less than what lies outside the radius of interest and comprehension at any given time. We hear, that is, with culturally attuned ears. The angles of our geometries of attention are periodically adjusted, sometimes radically reoriented, this century's formal investigations into experiences of silence have meant opening up previously inaccessible or unacknowledged or <coughs> forbidden territory, where the very act of attending entails a figure-ground shift. 
We continue to be startled by Cage's discovery that silence is not empty at all, but densely, richly, disturbingly full. Full of just those things we had not, until now, been ready or able to notice, or reluctantly noticing, had dismissed as nonsense or noise. The long postponements of acknowledgement that constitute our cultural silences are not only accidental oversights, they are also indications of just how threatening to surface composure and cultural self-image the articulation of silence can be. Not an accident, but certainly an intriguing coincidence to discover the force of silence at precisely this cacophonous moment on the Western Civ timeline. A moment of accelerated technological momentum, hell-bent on drowning out silence in every form, once and for all, stuffing information into every crack. This is no paradox. All those probes and antennas, satellite dishes and cellular phones are designed to make the experience of limit and respite we have called silence as conceptually irrecoverable as the romantic idea of wilderness. And yet, cognitive intuitive frontiers remain. If silence was formerly what we weren't ready to hear, silence is currently what is audible but unintelligible. The realm of the unintelligible is the permanent frontier, that which lies outside the scope of the culturally preconceived, just where we need to operate in our invention of new forms of life, drawing on the power of the feminine. In the unnaturally constructed choreography of cultural survival, the text as rational, imperial, constitutive fabric has been understood as logically prior, defining the terms of the intelligible. For Judith Butler, who implicitly accepts the normative status of the intelligible, and therefore the constraints of this binary textual code, to make gender trouble is to act up as subtext, that is, to perform subversions, parody, pastiche, ironic mirrorings, deconstructive replications. Doing this, she believes, exposes the arbitrariness of the phallogocentric text. But this prescription for a performative femi feminine subtext doesn't spring the binary trap. On the contrary, it reinforces it by positing its referential stability and by ignoring strong traditions of multivariant feminine texts. To make real gender trouble is to make genre trouble. Which I like love. <laughs> Not to parody, but to open up explorations into form of unintelligibility, untillageability as transgeneric feminine frontier. I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit. Feminine textual traditions have had tumultuous histories of appropriation and rejection by women and men alike in the long topiary hegemony of masculinist values disguised as natural forms. It's been suggested by Luce Arigere and others that the feminine is perhaps nothing other than a plural, all that conspires against monolithic, monotonal, mono monolinear universes, complexities and messes that overflow constructions of the have been labeled variously over the centuries, but most strongly identified with the feminine. As alternative principle, it is, importantly, the transgressive term in an ongoing Western cultural dialectic between established order and new possibility. We may smart from raw awareness of the, indiv in the, of the invidious, invidiously destructive male-female binary, but its internal collisions and combustions have yielded constructively complex and paradoxical forms. Mastery, mattery, and strange powers yet to be named. Our best possibilities lie in texts slash alter texts where the so-called feminine and masculine take migratory, paradoxical, and surprising swerves to the enrichment of both, neither, and all else that lies along fields of limitless nuance. This is not a vision of androgyny, but of range, the collision with limiting principles that shut down possibility, like, quote, I am a man, I must write like a man, end quote, lead to interesting swerves. And then I'll read a bit more before I go on. A realistic optimism, not just for the feminine, but for the complex human, lies in forms that engage the dynamics of multiplicity, three and more. An acknowledgement of difference, yes, but more important, 
and generating a prol proliferation of possibility beyond invidious dualisms. The same global and space information technologies that are disembarrassing us of the illusion of other as absence are schooling us in multi-directional coincidence, a pattern coincidentally related to Carol Gilligan's web image of characteristic female thinking as a connective principle at least as forceful as monodirectional hierarchical cause effect. In a high-tech scientific era, recognizing both complexity and the constituting presence of chance in nature, we may be rediscovering that coincidence, everything at any given moment happening at once, presents the most remarkable challenge in our teeming, teeming electronically intimate global village. It happens that this has been the condition of women's experience for as long as our histories recount and imply. An interesting, an interesting coincidence, yes, no, that what Western culture has tended to label feminine forms characterized by silence, empty and full, multiple associative non-hierarchical logics, open and materially contingent processes, etc., may well be more relevant to the complex reality we are coming to see as our world than the narrowly hierarchical logics that produced the rationalist dream work of civilization and its misogynist discontents. I wonder if we may find in the collision of radically destabilizing institutions and emerging feminine forms the energy to make something unprecedentedly, poetically generous of our complex future. Let's essay into the seismic zone and explore some odd logics in the literary disposition of women's silence. I wanted to read so much more from this essay because it feels incredibly rich. Um, especially because in this text, the author goes on to talk um, very explicitly about the nature of the visual um, and the limits of representation as a place to try and find liberation both for people of African descent and for just kind of women more broadly. Um, as somebody who's been working on a book for a really long time that thinks very critically about um, the visual both in you know, traditional kind of narrative literature, but also in terms of new media, though of course with an asterisk, like what is the new, <coughs> new media, like what is media, et cetera. Um, I find myself often thinking about visual representation and visual self-representation in particular as something that is kind of very key to people being able to live lives that are a bit more full, um, and have experiences with others and with structures that are a bit more just. Um, Ratelak goes on to say that if we only conceive of liberation in terms of Enlightenment era understandings of the visual, um, then we're not actually doing the work of liberation necessarily. Um, kind of a master's tools, not being able to dismantle the master's house um, kind of way of thinking. Um, and I think that I, before I kind of continue what I want to say, I want to read like one more tiny thing, if that's all right. Cool, I'm just like, if I can structure this however, like, I still lose. Okay, um, there's a, so there are lots of parentheticals in this, but there's also brackets where there are working notes that are included. Um, working note, it's been assumed in a culture that ties knowledge and freedom to self-empowerment that the power of women, like that of everyone else, lies conceptually in the right to self-definition, politically in the right to self-determination. Add the two together, divide by I, and you get self-expression, yes, no. And I love it's always like yes, no, and I'll like yes, more no. <laughs> it's been part of the chronic disease of women in our society that self-definition was for so long understood as a private matter. Thus, women who daily played the role of domestic or office servant or otherwise diminutive person, often with little girl body language and undescended voices, seized on first-person forms, diaries, journals, confessional poetry, autobiographies, and autobiographical novels, all genres where the scope doesn't have to exceed first-hand and or self-knowledge. This is the field for self-definition as self-expression. Suppose we think of self-determination in art as invention, where the power lies in creating not just a self, but language games and forms of life that draw on public knowledge and exploration of otherness, thereby reforming by their very active presence 
the public sphere in which they operate. This might be seen as the realm of imagination that plays in the arena of the world, as opposed to fantasy that recedes into the envelope of the mind isolate, I solace. This would mean that the power of women lies not in expressing what has heretofore been stoppered within our cramped domain, scene of our silence, but in a radical reorientation that may explode the notion of domain as proprietor's home, body, self, to substitute the energetic principle of poetical form, socio-aesthetic socio values to live by rather than under, within, or through. Proposal for a healthy politics of identity, colon. To demand the right to work on one's subject position rather than to live out its destiny. And so to kind of wrap up my own thinking about how reading through this text, and much like Mariam, I, you know, before encountering, before being asked by Calmia to participate in this event, it's like I hadn't necessarily encountered this text before. Um, and reading through it, I wondered why. Um, and that's a question that I've struggled with a lot as I've dealt with uh, kind of analysis and deep kind of dives into the various objects of inquiry that I'm studying in my book project. Um, part of the questions that I'm asking um, entail me thinking about why I didn't come to know these texts um, until I was a 20-something year old graduate student, right? Like, why didn't I have access to these texts as an adolescent when I really, really could have used that type of cultural mirroring or that type of support in terms of my own identity development. Um, and so I wanted to read that extra little passage because I wonder what it looks like to make art that is not just about relaying what it's like to exist in one's individual corporeal shell, but about attempting to provide some type of framework um, that other people can use to live by, really. Um, and I feel like, as somebody who's making work that straddles a kind of critical cultural, like a critical cultural and creative place, um, people often shy away from prescription. Um, but I wonder what it means to bring prescription or like prescriptive language back into the creative and critical work that we do um, in terms of offering people models for what it means to have values and make lives and love and do all of the other things that it, you know, being a human being entails, um, like in a more just, like more equitable, more sustainable way. I think that's my time. Okay. So the text I chose was. Nobody mean more to me than you. So I'm actually going to give you a little bit about my analysis or the reason I chose this text before I read it. Um, so what I, what I loved about this is it was in some ways a, both a dynamic between a teacher and a student, or a teacher and her students, but also in the midst of external events happening in the outside world. And it was also about lessons being taught on the fly. So gaining a response from students and then reinterpreting the teaching material based on how they responded. Um, and I, I think we'll get, we'll, you'll, you might understand that after I read it. So I thought, uh, I thought a lot about the attraction of this text to me. And I, re I realized like it was a text um, that for me was actually about making mistakes. And it was for me um, a text about how nobody ever taught me to speak differently. And the only teaching I received was how to talk and act um, using standard English, standard white English. Um, and what I really, really loved is that it's also a story of high drama. So you'll see that there's a police shooting, um, there's a death of a family member. Um, so in some ways, the violence outside of the classroom enters the classroom. Um, and it's not nearly the same thing, but in my life of teaching, I'm often teaching, but also combating 
um, the racist structures in, acad in academia. So I'm doing I'm do I'm multiple like um, events are happening. So, um, so I teach students in the safety of a classroom, but how do you actually talk about social justice or hate crimes or violence against black people, immigrants? Um, what does it mean to teach Claudia Rankin citizen when you know that bullets are whizzing um, not too far away? Um, what does it mean to teach Song of Solomon? I mean, these are, these are texts I teach. And knowing that you also have to describe the fact that actually, like, the mythology of Song of Solomon was invented but also by this author. She didn't, didn't just um, come out of nowhere. I mean, there, a lot of thought went into this. Um, and what I also loved about this text is this phrase, is anybody alive in your language? Is anybody there? How can you translate the nobody in the English you and I speak, the standard English? And the answer in this text is you can't. So I thought like a little bit of this reading is for me to actually be a little bit embarrassed, um, to confuse myself a little bit. Um, because I will be reading Black English aloud, um, and and not as a, I mean, you feel free to laugh at me or whatever, but I'm actually for a moment considering it for us to consider it as the standard. Um, can we actually use our own way of speaking to fight the oppressor? Um, and I'm interested in how we can speak someone or something, even though someone tells us the way we speak is wrong. Um, even if that voice is inside of us that tells us we're wrong. It reminds me a lot um, <coughs> when I was in seventh grade and the, the teacher asked, hey, is anyone Hindu in this room? And I didn't raise my hand because I didn't want to be wrong. Um, so a part of this, um, I wanted to actually embrace the fact that we're all sitting around together. and. So a part of this would be like a little bit of a call and response, and see how it goes. Uh, um, a little bit is inspired by, I mean, I, I'm sitting with colleagues who have far more credentials than me, and um, so it's with some humbleness. I'm, I'm asking um, us to maybe like think about this together, and, and channeling a little bit about like um, Adrian Piper's funk lessons, the idea of actually maybe creating a little bit of more empathy rather than a headspace. Um, and finally, I'll say so this whole book, The Black Daughter Reader, is amazing because when I read it, I didn't actually know the authors. It's not here, it's not listed. And without knowing this was by um, this incredible, I mean, the, the world famous June Jordan, I. I immediately like this text. So um, I thought a lot about that, like how do we appropriate something and why are the authors not listed here? Um, so I'll read you a little bit uh, of, of what's, uh, I'll, I'll try to summarize a bit so to, sp to speed it along. Um, <coughs> the story begins two years ago. I was teaching a new course in search of the invisible black woman. And my rather large class seemed evenly divided between young black women and men. Five or six white students also sat in attendance. With unexpected speed and enthusiasm, we had moved through historical narratives of the 19th century to literature by and about black women in the 20th century. I had assigned the first 40 pages of Alice Walker's The Color Purple, and I came early, eagerly, to that class meeting. So, what do you think? How do you like it? The students studied their hands, the floor. There was no response. The mood was tense, resistance. Why she had them talk so funny? It don't sound right. You mean the language? Another student lifted his head. It don't look right, neither. I couldn't hardly read it. After this, several students dumped on the book. Again, I mean kind of sometimes my experience in the classroom. Um, <laughs> so again, I love this part. Um, just about unanimously, their criticisms targeted the language. I listened to what they wanted to say and silently marveled at the similarities between their casual speech patterns and Alice Walker's written version of black English. I decided against pointing out 
these identical traits of syntax. I wanted not to make them self-conscious about their own spoken language, not while they clearly felt it was wrong. Instead, I decided to swallow my astonishment. Here was a negative black reaction to a prize-winning accomplishment of black literature that white readers across the country had selected as a bestseller. I wrote the opening lines of The Color Purple on the blackboard and asked the students to help me translate these sentences into standard English. Um, okay, I'll, I'll read this example. So, you better not never tell nobody but God. It'll kill your mammy. Dear God, I am 14 years old. I have always been a good girl. Maybe you can give me a sign letting me know what is happening to me. Last spring, after little Lucius, Come, I heard, I heard them fussing. He was pulling on her arm. She say it too soon, Fonzo. I ain't well. Finally, he leave her alone. A week go by. He pulling on her arm again. She say, nah, I ain't gonna. Can't you see I'm already half dead? And all of the children. So this, what happens basically, so they, they start to, to have this conversation. And she gives this assignment on the fly of having them um, and I, I find this like really interesting, rewriting um, standard English into black English and the reverse as well. Um, and in the, in the middle of this, this, this student walks in and the student is, is the point of, of this drama in this classroom and he's basically a scholar that um, is going to South Africa to study apartheid and it turns out that he comes for a while and is a very, very good student, then he's, he stops coming. And then after some time, when he finally comes back to class, he tells um, his teacher, hey, look, my brother was shot, you know? And so that, that comes a little bit later, but um, let me, so I'll just read this part, which I think is interesting. Um, September 1984, breezy fall weather and much excitement. My class, The Art of Black English, was full to the limit of the fire laws. And in independent study, Willie Jordan, the student I mentioned, showed up weekly, 15 minutes early for each of our sessions. I was pretty happy to be teaching altogether. I remember an early class when a young brother, replete with his never-present, ever-present pork pie hat, raised his hand and then told us that most of what he'd heard was all right, except it was too clean. The brothers on the street, he continued, they mix it up more, like fuck and motherfuck, or like shit. He waited, I waited. Then all of us laughed a good while, and we got into a brawl <coughs> about correct and realistic black English that led to rule number one. Also, I love rules. I love like lists like this. So um, they kind of deal, they trade in this a little bit of generalization, a little bit of stereotypes, but it's kind of interesting. Um, so June Jordan says, rule number one, black English is about a whole lot more than motherfucking. As a criterion, we decided realistic could take you anywhere you want to go. Artful places, angry places, eloquent and sweet-talking places, polemical places, church, and the local bar and grill. We were checking out language, not a mood or a scene or one guy's forgettable mouthing off. Rule number two. If it's wrong in standard English, it's probably right in black English or at least you're hot. Roommates and family members ridiculed their studies or remained incredulous. You studying that shit at school? But we were beginning to feel the companionship of pioneers. And we decided that we needed another rule that would establish each one of us equally important to our success. This was rule number three. If it don't sound like something that came out of somebody's mouth, then it don't sound right. If it don't sound right, then it ain't hardly right, period. This rule produced two weeks of compositions in which the students agonizingly tried to spell the sound of the black English sentence they wanted to convey. But black English is preeminently an oral spoken means of communication, and spelling don't talk. So we needed rule number four. Forget about spelling. Let the syntax carry you. Once we arrived at rule number four, we started to fly because syntax, the structure of an idea, leads you to the worldview of the speaker and reveals her values. The syntax of a sentence equals the structure of your consciousness. That's my favorite line in this whole thing. 
If we insisted that the language of black English adheres to a distinctive black syntax, then we are postulating a profound difference between white and black people per se. Is it a difference to be prized or to be obliterated? There are three qualities of black English, the presence of life, voice, and clarity that testify to a distinctive black value system that we become excited about and try to maintain. Black English has produced a pre technocratic, if not anti-technological -techno culture. This was interesting, I mean, after watching Black Panther. Um, <laughs> more, our culture has been constantly threatened by annihilation, or at least the swallowed blurring of assimilation. Therefore, our language is a system constructed by people constantly needing to insist that we exist, that we are present. Our language devolves from a culture that abhors all abstraction, or anything tending to obscure or delete the fact of the human being who is here and now, the truth of the person who is speaking or listening. <coughs> Consequently, there is no passive voice. For example, you cannot say black English is being eliminated. You must say instead, white people eliminating black English. The assumption of the presence of life governs all of black English. Therefore, overwhelm overwhelmingly, all action takes place in the language of the present indicative. Okay, so this is the call and response part. Um, guidelines for black English. Number one, minimal number of words for every idea. This is the source of the aphoristic and or poetic force of the language. Eliminate every possible word. Number two, clarity. If the sentence is not clear, it's not black English. Number three, eliminate use of the word of the verb to be whenever possible. This leads to deployment of more descriptive and therefore more precise verbs. Number four, use be or been only when you want to describe a chronic, ongoing state of things. He be at the office. He been with her since forever. Number five, zero copula. Always eliminate the verb to be whenever it would combine with another verb in standard English. Standard English, she is going out with them. What would be the black English? She going, she going with him. She going out with Yeah. <laughs> Number six. Eliminate do as in, what do you think? What do you want? What you think? Yeah, what you think, what you want. Yeah. <laughs> Rule number three, four, five, and six provide for the use of minimal number of verbs per idea and therefore greater accuracy in the choice of verbs. Number seven. In general, if you wish to say something really positive, try to formulate the idea using emphatic negative structure. <laughs> He's fabulous. He bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Number eight. Use double or triple negatives for dramatic emphasis. <laughs> Tina Turner sings out of this world. Tina Turner, can you and I sing? Yeah, that's great. Um, Number nine, never use the ed suffix to indicate the past tense of a verb. She closed the door. She shut the door. <laughs> yeah, she closed the door or she have closed the door. Um, number ten, regardless of intentional verb time, only use the third person singular, present indicative for use of the verb to have. As in, as an auxiliary. He had his wallet when he lost it. <laughs> it says, he had him wallet, then he lose it. Or, he had seen that movie. He's seen that movie. Yeah, was seen that movie, or we have seen that movie. Um, so there's a few more, I'll just um, go through them. Observe a minimal inflection of verbs. <coughs> particularly, never change the first person singular forms to the third person singular. He goes to the store. of verbs. Particularly, never change the first person singular forms to the third person singular. He go. Yeah, he go to the store.
Yeah, so there's like 19 rules here. I mean, but I love this, but I, I want to finish with the end of the story, which, which is what moved me. So, and I, there's too much to read here, but basically, so the student I mentioned um, talks to her teacher, June, um, saying, hey, like, you know, this happened, I want to talk to the police, and so she helps them organize a legal counsel to get this case, um, to, bring, to bring justice to this case, and she realized, like, as they were petitioning, they had two choices. Um, So they could either speak in the language of their oppressor and maybe get heard, or they can continue the speaking that they um, continue speaking the way that they spoke, and they decided the latter. Thank you. I, I mean, it's really wonderful to see how many people have come out, and I think we have three really wonderfully interrelated. Um, selections, um, from my perspective, really unexpectedly interrelated. Um, and I, you know, and, and each of you have talked a bit about what moved you to kind of pick these works. Um, and, you know, I think in, in all three, okay, maybe I, I'm not going to ask a question, hold back, hold back. And then just open this up um, and invite you all to engage with the passages that were seen Well, I, I'll just start. Um, I really like both of your selections, and I saw how um, my selection and what I wrote about related to what you guys were talking about. Um, first, in terms of black English, Mariam talks black English with her <laughs> sister all the time. Um, and then you read a quote about self-definition and self-determination, and um, it, I find that it's important for me to have these two different things to refer to in order to um, sort of navigate this campus. So um, I just found mm -hmm. a lot of symmetry there. Mm -hmm. And I think what I found so interesting about the selection that I chose was not only the kind of tensions that I was thinking about or kind of thinking out loud about in terms of the visual, but this different take on self-definition, which I think is you know, per like Patricia Hill Collins, like a kind of <clears throat> crucial part, maybe even the center of like black feminist thought and critical or intellectual practice. It's like this move toward helping people to better define themselves and for one to better, be able to better define oneself. Um, and so this, my selection really helped me to kind of think a little bit, to kind of push the limits of my thinking about I guess what the limits of self-definition are, because it's still something that feels like very much um, a crucial part of kind of my day-to-day -day lived experience, but also, you know, what I tend to want to engender in other people through my work. how much all three of them, I connected with all three of them, all three of them said something or, or correlated with something um, within me, everything from defining myself every day from, I'm different from my friends that I'm normally with because I like a very large spe spectrum of music and reading books and you know, art galleries and things like that. When they don't like that, they'd rather clubs and do things like that. And I have to defend that to them to make them understand that that doesn't make me less black because these are the things that I like and you don't. It just means that I'm the black version of me. That's all I can be. And with yours, my name is Tiara, spelled T-I-A-R-A. -A. So most people say Tiara. When I'm home, I'm Tiara. When I'm on the phone at my job, I sound different from when you come and you see me in person, and the person's like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Why? Um, and with that, I'm from Mississippi, so there's a lot of bad English in there. Uh, everything from strawberry to straight and street. So I just, I connected with all of it. it. It was just funny that it was random selections that all three of you had, and then they did interconnect. But at the same time, it's like it just came together. Like they were speaking about me as they wrote all three of these at their separate times. So I just enjoyed 
back, just knowing that, just seeing that, knowing that somebody's having a conversation about that, and this is a book I've never even heard of. So um, just it felt good for me to know that this is a conversation. I'm not the only one, and that other people are experiencing it too, and figuring out how to navigate that binary life that we do have to live. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> It does raise this question, like um, Aaliyah's question, why did it take so long for me to find this? Right. Yeah. You know? yeah. This is a random moment on Facebook for me. Like, it just popped up in events that are happening. I'm like, I'm going to go to that. Yeah. Because <laughs> I said, I'm going to be 18. I'm going to get outside and see what I can find. So now this is a new book that I get to add to my library that's forever growing because I'm putting myself out there to find things like this. And I understand it's not going to happen naturally. Nobody that I know is just going to say, I read this great book. Here you go. You should see this right here. I think what's also really wonderful about the format of Adam Pendleton's book is that it actually existed as a kind of photocopied spiral bag reader. And so he, like, part of his artistic practice is actually you know, maintaining a Xerox photocopier that he Xeroxes things that he finds of interest. And so there's, this is, you know, if you look at the page, you know, it's, it's very much about kind of stumbling across a real range of materials that you don't necessarily expect fitting together. Um, he, uh, Joyce, he starts by writing his Black Data Manifesto, it comes in his first iteration in 2008. Mm -hmm. And what amazed me when I first encountered it are not just the texts included, but the sequence of them. Mm -hmm. So yep. it begins with yep. Hugo Ball's Data Manifesto, then Du Bois's uh, The Souls of Black Folk, mm -hmm. and then on to the third is Black Data Nihilismus by Amir Baraka. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that and I just thought, what? <laughs> like, I just, like, the way in which you take these texts and position them like, like a collage painting, like right. it feels like, it feels like a, 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 a German photo montage. Like you're looking at a Hausmann photo montage, but it's an anthology, and you realize how much the anthology, any anthology, is a collage. Right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was, I was pointing because that's Hugo Ball. He's <laughs> <laughs> looking down at us. <laughs> And also, one of the great things about that is that, and about the fact that it's just using the Xerox, it's how anti-institution it is, anti, like, um, the fact that it's just Xeroxing uh, pages from different books, I think is a very um, subversive gesture towards, like, the academia and a canon that perhaps sometimes academia can, like, put forward, right? So I think just the gesture of doing this is, um, is you know, subversive in many ways, and it's resisting uh, sometimes, what can sometimes be an oppressive institutionalization of, of these texts. Which I think also like, makes room to, for the type of labor that um, works against forgetting. Um, and one of the things that I really loved about the text that I selected is that kind of right towards the beginning, um, she mentions the cultural silences that befall radical difference will prolong the obscurity of some of the names I've listed. Mm -hmm. This idea that artists who exist on the margins, especially if they're doing some of that more kind of avant-garde work, um, tend to fall through the cracks um, for a number of reasons. Um, that's one of the things I'm thinking about in my larger project. Um, one of the objects of inquiry I'm looking at is Nella Larson's quicksand. And so I'm thinking about this notion of obscurity, um, what it means to die in obscurity, why some people are more likely to die in obscurity than others, um, and just kind of more broadly the um, precarity of like black female artists in the United States in the 19th and 20th century in particular. And so I think that when you when you think about the medium of this text and how it existed before it was like. A fifty-dollar art book, but just like a, a xeroxed thing that this person passed around. It's like it's one way that is a model, perhaps, for us for how to share texts that are of interest to us in order to stop this kind of mass forgetting of people who are doing important work on the margins. So I, I would actually. So I think that's really what I love about the. I, because we are in a kind of moment where that is really possible. I mean, we can make a, 
like Google shared drive, where some, some kind of shared drive where we can share these kinds of texts. Um, and <coughs> what's also wonderful about this book is that it kind of invites us to kind of like, okay, let's scan this thing and just kind of describe it because A, it's out of print and it's also, you know, 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's, there's lots of ways in which the book itself kind of invites these new forms of sharing, uh, but it also reminds us of forms of sharing that we've actually, in the, the university context, been doing a, a lot of, right? I mean, back in the days of photocopied readers um, as a kind of instead of a textbook. That's something that we've done. And I, I wanted to kind of talk a bit about institutions, and especially the university, as a place where work on the margins and work on the avant-garde can actually happen or has happened. I mean, so in the case of Adrian Piper, um, I think part of what enables her work is the fact that she was one of the first tenured philosophy professors um, in the United States. Um, and I also can't, so I have to admit, I, I came to all of these texts very, very late. Um, my training is in kind of German intellectual history. And so I, you know, I <coughs> at home precisely in the kind of enlightenment um, that is so problematic. Um, but at the same time, it seems that there is an interesting language um, in that entire tradition that, that might help us think through the possibility of sharing, um, the possibility of, I mean, Adorno talks about the kind of proper comportment or relationship to others, both conceptual, artistic, aesthetic, and interpersonal, I would argue, is a kind of snuggling up to the other. So a kind of snuggling up that it doesn't presume that you understand, can consume, can absorb, um, can dominate. I mean, so there, there are in some ways these kind of models that are out there and accounts of what community and language can do, even in Kant, you know, when, you, when the question is asked, how do we create, you know, a, a way of being that allows other people to live by I mean, that feels close to the categorical imperative, right? Um, the whole question about language and structure, and how we kind of learn how to negotiate these structures and learn different standards, um, the kind of feels to me very much at home in this kind of enterprise of understanding language at the, at the level of syntax, at the level of its accrued history. I mean, this is like the Grimm's coming up with the etymological dictionaries. Um, and so there's, I, I feel like I'm kind of now rambling, but there's there's such richness in all of the kind of, um, the, the text that you've selected, but it's also interesting to me that for so many of these artists, or at least I'm thinking of Adam Pendleton himself, um, Adrian Piper, um, or not just artists, but Angela Davis, I mean, there, there is this kind of like interesting like hanging out in Germany, they're fighting a, a voice in Germany. Mm -hmm. This is published by Koenig, um, you know, major German publisher. Um, it, it's interesting that Ger Germany has, and Piper lives in Germany, teaches there. Um, it's interesting that there is a kind of, um, let's say, a linguistic and intellectual institutional framework that seems to be possible there. And perhaps less, well, I, I don't even know if it's less possible here, but I, I wonder if any of you have thoughts about that. It, it's just a kind of coincidental thing. I've never thought about it that way. Um, and this is like barely an answer to your question. <laughs> um, but my good friend from undergrad, um, like Dr. Edna Bonhomme, who's like maybe one of the most like badass, like black lady socialists I know. Like she's like a 33 year old woman who's like, I'm a fucking socialist. <laughs> it's like, that's really <laughs> rad. Um, and she, you know, graduated, you know, with a PhD in the history of science and was like, I'm moving to Berlin <laughs> because that's where, as like a first gener, as like a first generation Haitian American mm -hmm. from a very working class family who's been educated in elite, predominantly white, private institutions for the past decade plus. Like I don't feel a sense of possibility in the United States that I feel when I'm there. Mm 
Um, and so I don't, it's like not, it's like a, one anecdotal example, yeah. um, kind of in support of the connection that you just made, but it's like I had never really thought about this notion of possibility and like black intellectual and creative possibility and the ways in which it might, I mean, people often talk about France, <laughs> right? right? When it comes right, to right. black cultural Absolutely. production, but they don't necessarily think about the ways that um, German intellectual history, kind of cultural yeah. history, is like a key part of yeah. like black cultural work. Yeah, I mean, Du Bois, too, just as you know, mm -hmm. Du Bois, too, has a very formative experience in German history. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm curious how my colleagues like uh, actually read the, the whole book. I mean, what I really like is um, I can pick and choose um, parts of it, and I can read it as I can, um, I can invite myself into the text. Um, and I know enough now by a little bit, but you know, by re-educating myself through school uh, is chronological like history or like highly authorial text kind of like don't bring joy to me. Um, <laughs> and that's what I love about the Dada idea for this thing is like um, is having a little like fun with mashing and playing with, I mean, I just read something I realized from 1984. Um, and I'm not sure I would have encountered that um, in relation to some of these other texts. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what I found really joyful, is, um, is that Dada aspect, uh, rather than, oh, like a dry kind of, I'm going to tell you, like, I'm the author, I'm going to tell you the history of this art from these, um, this group of people. Uh, and that was, that was very attractive, because I, I literally just, thumbed through it and read it piecemeal. And there's even a couple that I found not interesting, but for the most part, I think like, it's so much fun, you know, just to like read this, so uh, um, that's like, the joy of it was, um, was I thought like a high appeal of, of my reading of it. Um, yeah. I, I would agree. Um, <clears throat> I think I enjoy the non-linearity of it, you know, it's just, like you said, like with other books, you just you have to start from the beginning and go all the way to the end. And here, you know, you just open up a page and you're just struck by certain images or certain words that stand out. So that's what really attracted me. And I'm curious to see what um, Adam Pendleton's experience on this campus will be like. Mm -hmm. Um, since it's a very you know, white campus, um, you know, I'm just wondering, with his perspective, how he's, how will he see this place? So, I'm curious. We're curious too. <laughs> <laughs> We're so glad he's joining us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the title of Black Dada is it's really interesting. I mean, in terms of the Dada movement, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I would be curious too. Yeah. But uh, you know, one of the things that I find interesting about his approach to Black Dada um, or to Dada is that Dada has a reputation of being predominantly white, um, predominantly male. Um, I mean, there were you know very very important female Dadaists, uh, but but it it does kind of have a, a reputation of being a white male super macho. And, um, and it's also, by this point, as cutting edge, as marginal, as kind of transgressive as it has been, um, it, has, it is now firmly entrenched in the canon, right? And so one of the things that I found interesting about working on the exhibition, but also um, thinking through something like Black Data, are the ways in which um, institutions can also be co-opted. The, and institutions and moments in the history of art that may have may or may not have worked out can be retold and restructured and refabricated into something that can sustain and do other work. And so um, I think the kind of vision, and, and so like by by putting all of these texts from very different moments, very different disciplines, articulating different futures, um, I think offers a strategy, um, a, a kind of tactical strategy of basically 
laying claim to stuff that might never have been yours to begin with. I mean, it's not as if Western civilization hasn't done that. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a way in which there's a kind of like tactical um, occupation, redescription, and redeployment of um, a whole kind of arsenal of concepts, approaches, tactics um, that I found really appealing about you know this this work and Adam's work in relation to the show that we're trying to do. Um, and so again, you know, we have this kind of it's kind of data we almost always immediately identify with anti-establishment, anti, um, you know, anti-everything, right? Um, but but it also requires and becomes um, again a kind of institution. And institutions do create spaces where certain kinds of conversations can happen. Um, I hope you don't mind if I can just follow up. So in preparation for um, Adam's visit this week, I've been out on YouTube, like you do. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw this extraordinary, uh, some documentation, video documentation of an amazing performance he did in 2007, just before um, he made the shift into this sort of multimedia black data project. Um, and it's a performance piece called The Revival, and he performed it as part of um, Performa 2007, so that there's a few search terms, you'll find it if you just do Performa 07 Revival. Um, and uh, describing it, he, he said he wanted the structure of a black church service, and he performed in a white suit with black robe gospel choir. Um, but most of the, the text that he spoke um, was appropriated texts from people as diverse as some of the people in the, in the reader, um, and, and Larry Kramer, um, the radical gay rights activist. And so he took um, a, a church service and backed by a choir, he read Kramer's um, a, a short speech that starts, I love being gay, I love it. Um, and he was s s performing it in this very sort of, um, a, a, this charismatic but also confessional sort of style. And then in discussion afterwards with a, one of the curators, he says, oh, yeah, that's an appropriated text. And, and he says, I appreciate the found structure. I appreciate the found language, but I'm going to resignify it. And by placing it in this, uh, the structure of a church service with a gospel choir, I make it signify very, very differently. Um, and so the audience, of course, had no idea that, that he was speaking mostly appropriated texts um, and, and never indicating when he was switching from one to the next. Um, but it was precisely by working within that institutional structure with its, with its ritual that he was able to take all of these um, other texts and embody them and, and make them signify in a way that was, to his mind, radical. Um, and, and for him, um, that was a sign of what Black Data would become as, you know, in terms of its appropriation, in terms of the way it takes structures like, say, a book, um, a $50 fancy art book, and, and turning it into a, a, a collage in which each, each piece resignifies off the other. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to learn more about the book itself, uh, its production, and, and, and what was happening in Adam Pendleton's life in 2008 that led him to assemble the, the photocopies, I, I take it. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll look that up on that later. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just, for, for those of you who are interested um, in some resources, I thought I would share too. Um, I mean, well, let me put it like this. It's a great dovetailing, I suppose, of the kind of um, ongoing embrace of the fair with punk zine vibes and in institutions right now, also, as I see it. But um, I mean, a lot of people, I think, would do PDFs. Actually, in a way, a PDF might be um, more viable than like a Xerox machine, frankly. But anyways, um, on Facebook, if you go to a group called Ask for PDFs from people with institutional access, if you don't know it, you'll find thousands of people. Uh, and you post a request, like, I'm looking for, you know, I space to Butler's chapter four, you know, like whatever it is. Uh, people get back to you. But then I noticed in the last week that someone just put out a reminder, a reminder 
that arg is still running. So some of you may remember from some years ago that the organization arg, um, which is a whole bunch of things, um, <laughs> got into a beef with someone connected from the left publishing house, Verso, which has incredible ironies to it. So <laughs> pissed that ARG was posting leftist PDFs that people could download for free. <laughs> it was like infighting. Anyway, so ARG was down for a while, now it's back. But if you go to the Facebook group, again, ask for PDFs from people with institutional access. There's a post from April 12th saying, send me your email, and we'll send you the, the invite to ARG, and now it's called ARG.fail. So two <laughs> well, library genesis as well. Also like a place where you can download PDFs. You know what? That's so funny because, like, in effect, your comment and and sort of jives with Jen's comment is actually the selection from Hugo Ball mm -hmm. that um, that Pendleton Tin selects because what it's about is in effect the repurposing of the term data. Mm -hmm. So for Holson Beck. We stabbed a knife in a dictionary, it was data. That's his origin story. For, um, uh, for uh, uh, Tristan Zara, it literally meant nothing. For some other of the Eastern Europeans, it's da, da. It means yes, yes, it's affirmation. Uh, someone said it was a, a hobby horse, and I forget which language. Um, so Kugel <laughs> Ball takes this idea of multiplicity. It, it's, it's perpetual repurposing of the term as his kind of starting point of a kind of radical openness, refusal, refusal of closure. That would be a strange place to have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what you were saying initially um, reminded me of the, it's a, Free PDF, uh, PDF online, and one of those sentences that gets quoted from it a lot is the only legitimate relationship to the university is a criminal one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Fred Moten's final arms, mm -hmm. um, the underground. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, an, it's interesting it's where obviously uh, in, in one kind of institution, but being hosted by another more recently founded one. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if people wanted to talk about the different ways they relate to those, how it comes about that one decides um, we want to not necessarily just operate inside of one or team up one with the other. I mean, I can speak from my own perspective, and uh, you know, I think there, there's a real one of the questions that I've asked a lot is what what can and this is going to be the topic of Jen and my um, co-directing of Overman seminar. Um, or a symposium on um, what can the museum become. And uh, that's going to happen in 2019-2020. Um, and traditionally, I mean, the, the things that you see on the wall for the most part in this exhibition, um, and the exhibition does not include the African collection, um, most of this stuff traditionally would not belong you know, in a museum setting until very recently. And, um, you know, in doing this show, one of the things that we've been asking about a lot is how can we basically make use of the institutional resources and on some level as much as there are, there are a lot of problems with the institution, but how can we turn this space into one that can engender different kinds of conversations, bring in a broader, you know, bring the community into our, you know, still kind of transitional temporary space. Um, so the partnership between, this is one of many things that I think the Stanley has done with PS1 and also, I mean, this is the beginning, the Center for African Future Studies is a very young institution. Um, it seemed important, um, or, or was important, it is important to me, um, to find lots of different ways to kind of initiate a broad a range of conversations. So that includes this community, but that also includes, you know, elementary school children, it includes rural Iowa, 
Um, but in, in this particular context with Adam Pendleton, what we really sought to do was to create um, precedent you know, that um, the, these kinds of conversations can happen you know, in the space of the museum, right? Um, um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question. Um, partially because, so Public Space One has uh, been around for 15 and a half years now um, in Iowa City, and um, tends often we have defined ourselves, you know, um, against the university or like as an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet, of course, you know, our, throughout, I, we're founded by pe people who are students in the university and throughout, um, including uh, the cast wouldn't exist without the university either because the reason that Anais came to Iowa City and suggested starting this program was because of coming to the writer's workshop. Um, and so, um, intellectual and creative labor costs money. Um, and so there is, on the one hand, this desire to kind of keep these ideas moving and flowing, hence PDFs and sharing and that entire kind of idea, the concept. But it also, just as, you know, everything on the walls here are done by people who are not just doing it because they love it, um, but they're doing it because they're committed, um, they're doing it because they are trying to kind of form new kinds of communities. They publish things so that they can also, you know, make some cash money. You know, um, so there's, there, what's, what's fascinating to me about the kind of, you know, yes, $50 expensive, you know, this is, he's a part of the art world, you know. He is an artist who has established his reputation and has worked um, and has been very canny about how to negotiate this entire system as a system, right? Um, and, I, and I guess one of the things that's been unexpected for me working on Dada, um, but also working at Dada at this institution and with, you know, my colleagues, is uh, how much, like, at least my sense of Dada is now actually very much an institutional sense, but institution not in the, in the idea of like, well, now it's been institutionalized, so it's dead. Um, but it's sort of like, no, now we're infected. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's a virus that we caught. <laughs> now we're just trying to figure out what it's doing. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. So it, it, you know, I think thinking about institutions and institutional partnerships that makes sense. I mean, certainly the are three institutions or two, and uh, I, I feel like. PS1 is sort of like this incubator for um, a, a lot of different sorts of projects. Um, how we can kind of, we at the Stanley can, can help in that endeavor is something that I'm really interested in exploring. Um, it, is a, it is a virus I found interesting because earlier you said that it became part of the canon, but I was thinking, has it become part of Western canon, or is Western canon now become part of the data? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, now I want to find my own copy of the book, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a I think you might be able to snag a copy. Speaking of alternative institutions, mm -hmm. at, um, you could, if you order it from Printed Matter in New York City, um, that's where I got mine, um, and they had stacks and stacks because they threw a book launch party mm -hmm. for Pendleton. So um, it's wonderful to see that book on a central table in Printed Matter, yeah. given that institution's yeah. history um, and its relationship to the Franklin Furness Archive. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that that's one way. To, one of the reasons I enjoy that, that placement so much is because. Uh, back in the 70s, when no one, they couldn't give away real estate in New York. Some very savvy, candid <laughs> artists worked the system. They, they didn't even have, they had to live in their studios with no hot water. They worked the system, and they 
got live work real estate and they created Franklin Furnace, this alternative performance space um, in printed matter. And now they have nice digs on 10th <laughs> Avenue. But you can order directly from them and, <coughs> and bypass the Amazon man. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we could work our institutional privilege and get the library to buy multiple copies. <laughs> I had to ILL it for this week because Roger Monk had it. Oh, one copy. <laughs> That's photocopy. <laughs> I did take photos of all of the prefatory matter so that I could read it. When I like the books. So if anyone wants that. Well, I want to thank you for organizing this amazing event. And um, I would just thank to everybody who spent a beautiful spring afternoon in the museum with us and for the speaking for the marvelous remarks. Um, and uh, yeah, so. And thanks to Anna, please. Yes, yes, yes of course. Thanks to yeah, Anna. She can be here. She's in New York. Yeah. And could you tell us again like, when and where? In those yes, states? of course. So Adam Pendleton is coming. At seven, he's going to be speaking at 7.30 um, at uh, Art Building West. Thursday. Thursday. And we'll continue to circulate um, flyers and digital reminders on various platforms. Platforms. And please do sense, you know, spread the word. And uh, this is, I think this will be a lot of fun. And, um, Thanks. Thank you.